Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Duality 9Xers around the world. Welcome back to another exciting episode. Hey guys, we got a great lineup of videos to share with you guys. As usual, we need your help to separate fact from fiction. So real or fake, well, that's a decision you need to make. If you guys are new to the space, smash the like, subscribe, and comment. Comment on the videos, tell us what you guys think. So if you guys are ready and if you guys are strapped in and settled in, well, it's going to be a bumpy ride, so let's go. The reason I took the jellyfish UFO seriously is because I have direct first-hand knowledge of a video of a jellyfish UFO coming in down between the nuclear silos and then popping up and shooting off at 45 degrees with instantaneous movement. Are there more UFO sightings around big bodies of water? If you are going between star systems and planets, right? You have to worry about what? Like heat and pressure, and atmosphere, right? What is gonna be the same anywhere in the galaxy? If you have liquid water, it has to be within a very narrow temperature, yeah. and there's gonna be a very narrow amount of pressure depending on the depth of that water. So that could be why water has always played a role in lakes and oceans, and they are absolutely reported coming in and out of the water. I released radar thermal, infrared, and deck footage from 2019 with 10 warships being swarmed simultaneously by over 100 UFOs. It was confirmed by the Pentagon. So man, look, it's happening. You guys must have heard about this uh, jellyfish uh, alien video. Uh, I'm going to try to get some uh, video of it and share it um, in one of my videos here, but it's absolutely incredible. You see this like jelly-like kind of thing entity just kind of float around like and people are staring at this so it's not like i mean it's really hard to say the origins of this video but um i, I don't know if you can really deep fake this um but it's it's really shocking stuff i i wish they showed it here Judith Love Cohen was an American engineer who helped create the guidance system that brought Apollo 13 back home safely. While working on a crucial equation one day, she went into labor but took the problem with her to the hospital. She soon called her boss to tell him that she finished it. Then she gave birth to Jack Black. NASA employs a man named George Aldridge to sniff everything before they send it to space. If George doesn't like the smell, it doesn't go to space. The Kessler Syndrome is the theory that a small collision of our satellites could cause a major catastrophe for humanity. The collision could create a cascade where satellites break into tiny pieces and destroy other satellites, until the Earth is surrounded by a massive cloud of flying shrapnel. This would make it impossible to leave the planet for many generations. I didn't think about that. I mean, there's a lot of satellites in there. <laughs> a lot of metal kind of floating around in our atmosphere. Let's see. Now, Miss Girl, you know you are dead wrong for the first one. She and sometimes Kendall and their friends would come into this bar slash restaurant I used to work at in West Hollywood a few years ago. And they would get the whole place closed down for just them. They would get everything for free, a whole spread. Sometimes they wouldn't even touch some of the things on the table. They'd get bottles of 1942. They treated the staff like shit under their shoe. And um, you would think after all that they would leave something. Don't you know being in their presence is payment enough? Come on, not a dime. Not a nickel, not a penny. Nothing. Eventually, they had to stop telling the staff when they were coming because we all tried to call out. So, let's see. The big zero, guys, not a. It's a big price that you have to pay to be in the, the shadow of a celebrity, a major celebrity, right? Well, that kind of sucks. I mean, I met some celebrities before, and they were pr some of them were pretty cool. Some of them, not so much. Yeah, just chill right there. How about a nice round of Wahlberg? What's up, Mark? What's up, Mark? Jelly. Mark? How you doing? How you doing? What's up, man? What's going on? It's good to see you. Where am I supposed to go over here? Yeah, just chill right there. Uh, we'll just all stand together like a happy fun bunch. Yeah. A happy group. Hold on. Eminem, you have any aspiration to act? That seems to be like a common thread. A lot of musicians sort of a next step. One day. Maybe one day. I'm trying to get where this guy is. I'm trying to get where this guy is, you know? Yeah. 
But yeah, soon, you know. I plan to do it. I'm, I'm trying to, you know. I want to do my thing with the music first, though. Yeah, you know, establish myself first. You do know. you uh, would you suggest like acting lessons for people who cross over? Or does it seem like that's not necessary anymore? Uh, I don't. I don't think it's necessary. You know, you either do it or you don't. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming, man. I was going to say congratulations. Number two Down. next week. Thanks for Shady in the stores. Pick it up. Oh, Mark, we're going to hang yeah. out. And uh, we'll get to number five right now. It's from Orgy. Here's Blue Monday on Total Request. How about a nice Yay. round of applause? Wahlberg. What's up, Mark? What's up, Mark? Hey, brother. I'm Jelly. What's up, Eminem, Mark? Mark? How you doing? How you doing? It was a little bit of uh, tension there. Did you feel it uh, between uh, Mark and Eminem there? Um, I'm not sure what that's about. Not sure if they had some beef prior to going live on TV. Um, something happened, maybe in the back room. Maybe somebody didn't like the other person's joke who knows it's not uncommon to see celebrities uh be a little bit cold like that with one another it was a normal monday morning we had the cage down and we'd seen three or four sharks standing on the back of the boat and kim spotted a pot of orcas someone comes running in and says there's an orca outside there's orcas outside well, i've been to sea for over 20 years and i've never seen anything like that What's that in the middle of, um, of, of the orcas? It's a different shaped fin. Hang on a second, something, something's a bit odd here. They must, they must have a shark. shark cage diving and we had the cage down and we'd seen three or four sharks um, you know so there was action happening and then in the distance we could see these you know, huge fins you recognized instantly that's orcas whatever they were doing uh, kept them on track they kept coming closer to us close to us they uh, they were just really on a mission they were they were hunting orcas tend to have a social hierarchy uh, usually run by the female wow. Um, so that we could see one mature female and we could see um, two, two younger orcas as well. Um, and then we saw two or three more orcas. We, we think in total there are about six. It was very interesting because there were a few divers in the cave. A diver actually stood up and he said, um, are, you guys, are you guys using an orca soundtrack or a whale soundtrack in order to attract the sharks? And we went, no, no, there are actually orcas, uh, you know, in the distance. So everyone was kind of watching them from the cage and you could hear them as clear as day. They weren't passing through, they weren't passing by the Neptunes, they were, they were in the same place and they were hunting together. Everyone's uh, on, on, the, on the deck were just looking and, what's that in the middle of, um, of, of the orcas? It's a different shaped fin. They were staying in the same place, uh, they weren't really moving around much. And then that's when we thought, hang on a second, something, something's a bit odd here, they must, they must have a shark. Um, and they stuck about for over an hour or so. Their movements were very, very particular. Um, they were herding something. They were staying within the same space. Oh, wow, and then look at obviously, that. we saw a pointed dorsal fin. That's the shark about to be attacked, I think. Oh, he's got him! Oh, hey! Oh, that great white is. Oh, the shark is coming straight for us. Oh my god. You've got to be. That's a great white just in front. Oh, They're cutting off the shark. He's in a U turn. That's a great white there. Right where the shark, oh, he just got him. Oh. oh my God. That shark doesn't know where to go. There was one moment where the shark was swimming away at, at quite, a, quite a fast pace. Um, but then that's when the, um, the two younger orcas decided to help their mother by corner, cornering the shark. And then the female kind of almost breached out of the water slightly and then landed on the shark. Um, obviously in order to stun, stun the shark. And then they went underneath the water, and then that's when the slick line uh, appeared. So I'm assuming if they wanted to go for the liver, which is you know, the fattiest part. You could see that there was uh, a couple of uh, the orcas down below, and there was a couple above, and they were doing this rounding up. It was corralled, they had it. They, and uh, it, from looking at it, it looked like they had been rounding it up for the whole time that they were coming towards us. And then one of the uh, biggest ones rose up in the water and plunged wow. down. Um, 
uh, onto the shark and it, the, its whole body was vibrating. You could see its, um, the muscles in its back and its, uh, um, that was, it was really spectacular, it vibrating, shaking. When we realised that they were hurting something, I just, emotions flooded, I just become so overwhelmed. I started crying, I was so happy, it was probably one of the best days of my life. Yeah, it was epic. I've, everyone on the board was absolutely ecstatic. Was, I've, I've been at sea for over 20 years and I've never seen anything like that. The orcas being a, such a huge creature compared to the shark, it was absolutely magnificent to see that close to the back of the boat. There were moments of silence, there were moments of you know, shock, there were moments of people cheering. Uh, I reckon, not, not afraid to admit, I probably started crying at one point. Everyone was just on the oh, edge of Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> what is happening? People were just amazed by what they'd seen. They, they didn't care if we seen sharks for the rest of the day because they just, that just blew them away. Everyone just couldn't stop talking about it. We were all out there to see the sharks, um, which are, you know, a, a really dominant and powerful creature. And these orcas were just, they were just totally unfazed it was just like, um, the shark was like passive, it was, like, it was all over, game, set, match. It is the ultimate kind of battle of the apex predator versus the apex predator. People have spent weeks, months and years on the ocean trying to, trying to get this sort of shot. And that's the great thing about working on the ocean is that you have no idea what, what the day is going to hold, um, what you're going to see. It's a completely wild environment, anything can happen. Wow, that's just shocking, guys. Orca, aka killer whale, is definitely the apex predator of the ocean. I don't think there's anything stronger than an orca. I've seen orcas in real life. Uh, it's it's an absolute treat. Uh, if you if you guys get a chance uh, in Canada and British Columbia, there's a place called Steveston, and um, right so essentially you can book these whale watching tours and uh, they'll take you out about two and a half hours into the into the Pacific Ocean. And that's usually where you're gonna run into quite a different, you know, quite a few pods of killer whales. And along the way, we actually saw a mink whale as well and um, a ton of seals. And uh, you, you, get your, you get your mixed bag of, um, of, of wildlife, you know, ocean wildlife. But to see orcas in their natural habitat it's absolutely incredible. I mean, some of these orcas weigh as much as an African elephant. So the, the interesting thing is when we went out there, we saw uh, probably, um, well, we saw multiple different pods of killer whales. And there was one pod uh, that was transient, the transient killer whales. They weren't really native to the area. They, they may have come down from like uh, Southern California or even further away. And... Um, they were there for like hunting purposes and uh and went and and the orcas they're smart i mean they're probably one of the smartest mammals that are out there and they know when we're in the ocean when, when they see all these different boats around they put on a show they start breaching the water going up and crashing right back into the water creating these huge ripple waves and 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 they know people are cheering on and stuff like that they're, they're having a great time you see these little guys in their kayaks like little people you know like people in their little canoes and kayaks just kind of going around them um yeah i mean if, if the orca wanted to could probably obliterate these little kayaks and canoes within seconds but they don't, you know, they're, 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 they're not after humans. They're not after, they're, they're not a threat to human species yet. But uh, it's absolutely incredible to see them. Uh, and, um, and I've seen and heard of instances in the past with great white sharks because everybody fears great white. So right? if you take an orca and if you take a great white, and if you look at them, chances are you're going to be scared of the great white shark, right? Because they just look more menacing and scary with their sharp dagger-like kind of fangs and teeth. And uh, but but it's the orca. It, I mean, it's the killer whales that are actually afraid of of the orcas. It's absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, if you guys ever get a chance, go to BC, go to Steveston, or even right off the coast of Victoria. Uh, the, you know, one time we, we were out in these little Metzler kind of inflatable boats and we saw a, po a pot of killer whales. And then all of a sudden our tour guide's like, oh, we got to turn back around. Um, we, we need to keep our distance because we're starting to get a little bit too close to these killer whales. 
and uh, and then all of a sudden somebody yelled out blood, blood, because you could see like part of the ocean started to turn into like a reddish color. So we're just like, what the heck just happened? Well, it just so happened that the, the pot of killer whales that we were looking at, that our tour guide was desperately trying to turn around and get away from, were transient killer whales that were feeding on a uh, purpose, a porpoise, sorry. Uh, so yeah, when they hunt, they can get pretty aggressive, pretty nasty. So you, you don't want to be around that. Anyways, I love, I love hearing about orcas and great whites. The camera moves forward and then returns. This makes it easier to see the wire they use for the levitation. If you come a bit closer, we can see the rope in three places, in the background, on his hand, and on his shirt. You can see the rope for a All few right. seconds. To hide the rest of the wire they masked it with the blue color of the sky. Additionally, the video's quality is quite low making it even easier to conceal imperfections. But there's another clever element that adds to the illusion. If you observe during the cut right around here. <laughs> what do you think? Try, try again, do a little bit better than that, come on. You'll notice that the voice doesn't cut or change, it continues seamlessly. This is done by overlaying the audio from the first footage onto the second footage. The magician employs a clever deception, primarily relying on wires connected to the left and right sides of the performance area, which are most likely attached to cranes situated off camera. However, there's a crucial aspect that demands explanation even though we know fully well Xavier is being held in my wire, but how does the magician manage to move the skipping rope around their body seamlessly, without any visible camera trickery or interruption of the skipping rope's motion? To execute this trick, we need to closely examine the diagram. It becomes evident that the magician's hand is gripping both the wire and the rope simultaneously. A more detailed view from the magician's perspective, particularly of the magician's right hand, reveals a firm hold on the wire, the rope, and the skipping rope handle. With great precision, the skipping rope handle is maneuvered around the wire, ensuring that the rope connected to the handle never makes direct contact with the wire supporting the magician's body. This meticulous handling successfully deceives our eyes, making it seem as though there are no visible object strings, or wires holding onto the magician. Pretty interesting. In reality, this is the mechanism used to rotate the skipping rope around the magician's body. Now, you might wonder how a wire can be so thin, yet strong enough to support the weight of the magician. Magicians use special industrial cables that resemble something like this, but they are relatively thicker to accommodate heavier loads. A wire of this nature can typically support approximately 60 pounds of weight. If the wire were made even thicker, it would be more than capable of bearing the weight of an entire levitating individual. It's important to note that in this trick, the weight is distributed and divided between the two ropes. Thus, neither wire is bearing the full mass of the magician. Instead, both wires share the load equally, allowing the illusion to be executed seamlessly. Shin Lim fools Penn and Teller for the third time in a row. Let's do a quick recap of what happened in the performance. In this trick, Shin Lim holds on to a blank playing card and asks Penn to think of any color of the rainbow. Penn thinks of the color red and by waving the blank card back and forth, the word red suddenly appeared on the blank playing card. Shin then asks Teller to think of any number, Teller thought of the number 47. Shin Lim once again repeated the motion and this time the word red had transformed into the number 47 and even had written the number in words to prove how confident he was with his prediction. Finally, he challenged Penn to think of absolutely anything he wanted, and Penn thought of the word Sun Ra. To our surprise, Shin Lim was even able to predict that magically on his blank playing card. Penn and Teller were amazed as they couldn't figure out his trick. Well, how did he perform this trick? Let's figure it out together. After watching Shin Lim's performance, you might assume this is pure witchcraft. Well there is a logical explanation to all magic tricks. I'll give some hints, see if you can figure out how the trick is done yourself before I explain it in detail. The very obvious thing that you may have spotted yourself is that, all three of the predictions were not printed on the card but were written by hand. If the predictions were written in a printed form, the trick would have been a lot more interesting, because it would prove he genuinely did predict the word beforehand. We then observe there is a slight mistake right here, which further supports our first observation of it being handwritten. This also implies that whoever is writing these predictions was rushing with it, since they made a mistake and try to correct it. This area right between his coat is extremely dark, seems like a pretty innocent observation, but you'll realize soon that the devil is in the details. 
We also find that only after Pan or Teller called out what they were thinking of, was when we noticed his middle index and pinky finger slightly move, as if he was trying to grab a hold of something. Well if you haven't figured out by now, the trick is fairly easy to perform but it can't be done alone, it requires an assistant. The assistant in this case would be most likely Shin Lim's spouse, Casey Thomas. To perform this trick Casey was wearing black gloves, and had blank cards in front of her, that were blank on one side, and completely black on the other. The moment Penn was asked to call out his thought of color. Casey wrote the word red on the card as fast as she could. When the moment came to pass the card to Shin, Shin Lim tilted his hand towards himself. Casey then placed the blank card upon the card Shin was holding. After squaring up the two cards, he showed that the word red, had magically appeared on it. The purpose of the black gloves and the black side of the card you may have figured out by now, was to camouflage the card transferring process with the black shirt Shin was wearing. To further support our logical explanation, we observed no crease in the card he displayed. Therefore, a flap card wasn't used. When it comes to playing card changes, it is executed by either removing or placing a card on top of another card. In this case a card was being placed. For the second and third prediction the same principle was used, where Casey wrote the called out word, and handed it over to Shin while wearing a black glove. So after the very last prediction, Shin was holding four cards together. Now you may be wondering, if he was holding four cards together, why didn't they split apart immediately when he was holding them with only two fingers? Well, the explanation for this is pretty straightforward and requires the blank cards to be gimmicked as well. The blank cards were gimmicks such that two of the four cards contain shim magnets. Shim magnets are extremely thin magnets sold by Shin himself. The remaining two blank cards contained a metallic shim inside. Therefore all four cards were sandwiched like so. Chris Angel's most viral body split illusion. Let's do a quick recap of what happened in the performance. In this trick, Chris Angel has a man and woman lay their backs on separate benches parallel to one another. Then he requests for four volunteers from the crowd in the scene to pull the legs and arms of the individuals laying on the bench. Afterward, the magician mysteriously splits the woman in half by placing his hands on her stomach. Also, he one. turns to the man and splits him in half as he did with the woman. With their bodies detached, he carries the woman's upper body and puts her on the ground. As he carries the man's upper body to place him on the bench he lifted the woman's upper body from, the woman crawls away in shock. Amazingly, Neither the woman nor the man are bleeding and their lower and upper bodies aren't lifeless. The man's legs are visibly moving on the bench and he moved his hands when Chris placed him on the woman's bench. Before the woman crawls too far away, the magician picks her up, calms her down, and puts her on the bench he lifted the man's upper body from. Thereafter, the magician performs one of the most amazing magic illusions ever caught on camera. He merges the man's upper body with the woman's lower body and merges the woman's upper body with the man's lower body. After merging them, both of them stood up and walked properly without any support or difficulty. Wow. Well, how did the magician execute his tricks? How did he? Here is how he did them. Chris used two look-alike males and females in this trick to make it seem like a real magic illusion, and the crowd around the scene were all stooges. If you have made it this far into the video, be sure to hit the like button, also consider subscribing, I would really appreciate the support. It really helps grow this channel. Thank you, now let's get back into the video. The woman he walks to the bench at the beginning of his magic show is the first female replica and is visibly young. Similarly, the man he initially asks to lie on the other bench is the first male replica. We notice several camera angle changes in the clip which enables the magician and his assistants to do setups whenever required without being detected by viewers. A camera cut happened after Chris asked some people to come over to pull the legs and arms of the man and woman lying on the benches. The purpose of this cut was to actualize the first setup, which was to change the woman laying on the bench to a different woman. Looking closely after the camera cut, we observe that the second female replica looks older, than the first female replica and her legs are fake. Oh. To trick the audience into believing it's the same woman, both ladies are wearing similar blouses and have the same hairdo. Also, the woman's fake legs are wearing the exact replica of the skirt the first female replica has on. In addition, the second replica female's upper body is completely real as she's half-bodied. Half-bodied humans are amputees or people that suffer from amelia, a physical abnormality present from birth or fractional emission of one lower limb or more at birth. Likewise, a half-bodied replica was used to replace the man laying on the other bench during the aforementioned camera cut. 
Both men have the same hairstyle on and are wearing sunglasses. The purpose of the sunglasses is to cover most of their faces to hinder viewers from spotting the difference between them. Additionally, unlike the half-bodied woman, the half-bodied man has short legs. To hide his short legs, he is wearing a plastic shell under his body to hide them. That explains why his body seems to be longer than hers and a black material can be seen covering the lower part of his body. We observe another setup when an extra camera cut is done and the man's fake legs appear to be moving. During the setup, two thin wires that are undetectable were connected to the fake legs. Hence, the magician's assistants pulled the legs to trick the audience when the camera started recording. When Chris seems to lay the half-bodied man on the bench to attach him to the woman's fake legs, a switch has been made. The man on the bench wasn't the half-bodied man but the first male replica. Looking through narrowed eyes, we discover that he presses the bottom of his shirt with his hands against the bench, before Chris lays him on the bench. Additionally, the shirt is split from the back and he doesn't have it worn properly, instead, he puts his hands and neck into it from the back. Also, he is sitting in a twisted position with his lower body well, taking the position of the woman's fake legs. While he maintains that sitting position with his legs in the skirt, the upper part of the skirt is braced to seem like the woman's lower body. Then, the camera is set to an angle that makes it appear like the man's upper body is still detached from the woman's lower body. Additionally, the man is wearing a model of the sandals previously worn by the first female replica. To make the trick work perfectly, his toenails are painted pink like that of the woman. When Chris supposedly attaches the detached man to the woman's lower body, we confirm our previous claim of his shirt not being worn properly. His body isn't in the shirt as he lays on his back, instead, the front and back of the shirt appear to be above his body. To prevent viewers from noticing the shirt, the camera was focused on the man only for a few seconds when the magician stood him up. In addition, the camera didn't show the man's back view the moment he stood up which would have exposed the entire trick. However, in an instant, he takes the shirt off and wears it properly when the camera sways from him to focus on the woman. Furthermore, the woman already had the exact type of shorts worn by the male replica under her skirt before the show started. Oh. Hence, she takes the skirt off revealing the shorts and wears a black pair of socks and shoes when the camera was still focused on the man. Thereafter, she replaces the half-bodied woman with the fake legs on the bench. Therefore, when they both stood up, their upper bodies were not switched. That's, uh, <laughs> that's some pretty crazy stuff. You know, it's it's just amazing what these magicians can do on screen and in, in you know, obviously in live. And, you know, if you get a chance to, to see these guys and what they do, it's absolutely incredible, especially people like Chris Angel. Um, now, I, I don't know the authenticity of this video. Uh, this is somebody's perspective as to what they think uh, exactly happened. It seems, it seems kind of legit. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's some things that are just unexplainable. Things that Chris Angel and others like him have done that you just can't explain. And even if it is a trick, the fact that they're able to pull it off like that in front of a live, you know, audience, that in itself is just mind blowing. Good facts. Part 159. If you don't want wrinkles but would prefer to stay away from Botox, this woman has a solution for you. To avoid wrinkles, Tess Christian claims to have not laughed or smiled for more than 40 years, even after the birth of her daughter. The individual animal with the most human kills ever was a tiger from northern India. After a tooth injury from a gunshot left her unable to hunt normal prey, she adjusted her hunting style to go for humans instead. She was shot and killed in 1907 with an estimated 436 human kills. Jeannie Wiley was locked in a room for 13 years by her father who wanted to protect her from the outside world. He kept her tied in a straitjacket and would bark at her like a wild dog if she made any noise. When she was finally rescued, doctors said she had the cognitive abilities of a one-year-old baby. Wow. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting stuff. Tigers, tigers are really scary, huh? I mean, beautiful, magnificent creatures, but imagine coming across one in real life. We're just staring at this liquid, like purple, spherical, just portal. And sadly, he was a daredevil. He starts walking up to it. I'm like, what are you doing? Are you insane? You can't go in there. I'm like, mom will kill you. And he goes, stop being such a baby. He looks at me, he goes, look, I'll be right back. He says, I gotta see what's on the other side. And he walks through. I remember being just sick to my stomach's fam. I was too scared to go in. 
and I, I'm just waiting for him to come back out. And it got to a point where I'm like worried sick, like mom's going to kill me. And then finally I, I hear something and there he comes walking back through and my stomach drops and the hair on my neck stands up. It, it, it was him, but he was an old man. He was gray haired. He'd aged uh, 60 years and 20 minutes. And I said, wow, my God, brother, what the hell happened to you? He said to me, how are you still here? It's, it's been years. I'll never forget the, the look on his face. Like he'd seen terrible things. And he just, he said, I love you, brother. He said, go back home. You know, he disappeared back into it. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah. And this guy was exploring this creepy house he found on Zillow when he came across a loose floorboard. He looked under it and this is what he found. They had no idea what it was, but the previous owner was a criminal, so maybe that has something to do with it. What do you think was in the fridge? Wow, that is No, weird. I know, I noticed that too. I don't know what this is. Huh. But there's a big bag in there with water. That might be a dead body. What the fuck is this? This guy was exploring this bag full of money that's the first thing that would probably come to your mind right bag full of weapons or unfortunately it could be somebody somebody in that bag above his eyebrows split his tongue like here are three people who transform themselves into animals first up lizard man eric sprague tattooed his entire body scaly green got subdermal implants above his eyebrows, split his tongue like a lizard, and sharpened his teeth. Next, Parrot Man. Ted Richards will do anything to look like a parrot, including tattooing his face and eyeballs, getting horn implants on his forehead, which doesn't make sense, and even removing his ears. And finally, the stalking cat. Dennis Abner's entire goal was to look like a tiger. Therefore, he got insertable whiskers around his mouth, gave himself a cleft lip, got fangs and tattooed tiger-like stripes on his face. Wow. I love uh, Real PK Chronicles. This guy's absolutely incredible. He's amazing. He has some a very, very good quality content. If you guys get a chance to, you got to definitely subscribe to him. In fact, I'll put his uh, information in the description. Um, he's definitely worth, um, uh, you know, definitely worth watching. Uh, really, really good stuff. I've actually featured him, uh, featured one of his videos in in one of my earlier videos. Uh, maybe I'll put the uh, put the link to that video in here as well too. All right, guys. Well, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, I want to thank you guys for for staying till the end. Again, if you if you guys enjoy this uh, content, you know it would be. We would be forever grateful if you could just smash the like, subscribe, and comment. You know, we played a number of different uh, videos here. Some were a little bit longer than others, uh, but hopefully you guys enjoyed them. I'd love to hear your guys' comments on what you guys think. What, you know, are, are these videos real? Are they fake? Um, what, what do you guys think? You know, so, uh, and in the comment, if you're gonna, if you're gonna put a comment down, include where you're from. Uh, so I can give you guys a shout out in uh, one of our next videos. Um, so we've got people from all four corners of the world that watch this and uh, we'd love to know where you guys are from. So again, I want to thank you guys. Uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day uh, until our next video. And in the meantime and in between time, that's it. Another exciting episode here on Duality 9X. I look forward to catching you guys on the next one.